yeah uh, a very good evening to all of you and i welcome uh, everyone to the sixth series of the inaugural asian cardio oncology society meeting uh, today we have a very interesting and exciting uh, sessions lined up and uh, without much ado i would uh, invite uh, our chairperson for the first session uh, dr uh, 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 dr raghu uh, digumarthi for uh, uh, introducing our keynote speaker uh, thank you dr vivek uh, uh, let me introduce dr michael fradley he is a graduate of the johns hopkins uh, um, school of medicine from where he also completed his uh, residency in internal medicine through the osler medical residency program he then went on to obtain dual fellowships both in cardiology and clinical cardiac physiology from the massachusetts general hospital he is a, a committed cardio oncologist and an electrophysiologist his clinical interests include the treatment and prevention of cardiovascular disease in cancer patients as well as survivors he also has expertise in cardiac implantable devices and in the non invasive management of heart rhythm disorders his research focuses on all aspects of cardiac oncology however he has particular interest in diagnosis and management of arrhythmic complications associated with traditional and novel cancer therapies so let us hear from dr michael fradley uh, who is now presently at the uh, faculty as uh, pen cardiovascular medicine on arrhythmias and cancer so pre intra and post treatment over to dr michael fradley well i want to thank the organizers of acos for inviting me to participate in this meeting i'm both a cardio oncologist and an electrophysiologist um and ep issues really are a significant problem in cancer patients with many more questions than answers and treatment requires a nuanced and collaborative approach to care these are my disclosures so three main objectives for today's talk. First, uh, I want to review the current state of knowledge of cancer treatments. Second, I want to discuss novel data regarding arrhythmia management in cancer patients. And then finally, highlight some challenges in rhythm management in cancer patients. So I want to start off by briefly mentioning some recent data on cancer treatments associated with arrhythmias. And we'll start off with the BTK inhibitor ibrutinib, which is a small molecule inhibitor of the Bruton's tyrosine kinase and is used in the treatment of various B-cell malignancies such as chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Now you probably know that ibrutinib is associated with the development of atrial fibrillation with rates up to 15% reported in the literature. In this systematic review and meta-analysis, the pooled rate of ibrutinib-associated atrial fibrillation was 3.3 per 100 person years, compared to 0.86 per 100 person years for non-ibrutinib regimens, with a relative risk of ibrutinib-associated atrial fibrillation of 3.86. Now beyond atrial arrhythmias, there's also increased rates of ventricular arrhythmias with ibrutinib. In the original FAERS data set, there were 13 cases of ventricular arrhythmias with six sudden cardiac deaths. And the majority of these individuals had no history of cardiovascular disease. And then a follow-up study from Ohio State looking at 582 ibrutinib-treated patients reported the incidence of ventricular arrhythmias at 596 per 100,000 person years. So much more rare than our atrial arrhythmias. However, of course, ventricular arrhythmias can be much more dangerous. Now, there's emerging evidence into the mechanism of ibrutinib-associated arrhythmias. Uh, we know that arrhythmias are not due to QT prolongation, and in fact, our group recently demonstrated QT interval shortening with ibrutinib. Now, with this in mind, Zhang and colleagues demonstrated abnormal calcium handling in ibrutinib-treated myocytes with significant decrease in the amplitude of calcium release. And even more intriguing is a publication that was just released this week suggesting C-terminal CERC kinase inhibition as the mechanism by which ibrutinib leads to atrial fibrillation. And this was a really fascinating study because uh, 
it suggests the reason why we see increased rates of atrial fibrillation with ibrutinib and not with some of the uh, second generation BTK inhibitors like a calibrutinib, which doesn't have this impact on the C-terminal CERC kinase. Now moving into the field of immunotherapy, I wanna start off with a brief overview of the mechanism of action of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we know that T cells express both PD-1 and CTLA receptors, and when they interact with their respective ligands on antigen-presenting cells, negative co-stimulation occurs, leading to the inhibition of T cells. These immune checkpoints prevent autoimmune reactions from occurring, but cancer cells are smart, and they've learned to express these ligands, helping them to evade the immune response. Blocking these interactions with immune checkpoint inhibitors allows T cells to attack cancer cells, but can also lead to autoimmune reactions. Now, both tachy and Brady arrhythmias are common initial manifestations of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, as seen in this original report from the New England Journal of Medicine. And in this study on the left from Jack Cardio Oncology, arrhythmias and heart failure really dominate the associated adverse cardiac events that are seen with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And then if you look at a related study on the right, you can see that atrial fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmias, as well as conduction abnormalities occur with significant frequency in patients treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, one interesting question is whether there remains a long-term risk of arrhythmias after immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis resolves. While this question hasn't been specifically evaluated, there is evidence to suggest a higher incidence of life-threatening ventricular tachycardia, overall mortality, as well as ICD implantation even many years after recovery from other types of acute myocarditis. And now that there are an increasing number of long-term survivors after treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors, this may become an important area for investigation in the future. And finally, I want to just touch on CAR-T therapy, since this is really a novel and emerging area. So we know that chimeric antigen receptor T cells, or CAR-T, are a novel immunotherapy in which T cells are genetically engineered to attack cancer cells. Now, CARs are artificial proteins consisting of both antigen recognition and T cell signaling domains. T cells from patients are genetically altered to express the CAR, which allows them to then attack cancer cells that express the target antigen. So in our study of 137 CAR-T recipients, 12% uh, experienced a cardiovascular event defined as a composite of an arrhythmia, which was mostly atrial fibrillation, decompensated heart failure, or death. Now the median time to the event was 21 days, all occurred with a cytokine release syndrome score or CRS score of two or higher, and 95% had an elevated troponin. Now the duration between CRS and tocilizumab administration, which is an IL-6 antagonist meant to help uh, quell the cytokine storm, was associated with cardiovascular events with the risk increasing by 1.7 fold for every 12 hour delay in tocilizumab administration. Then if you look at the uh, study on the right, this was something that was recently published by, by Dr. Lefebvre, who's our cardio-oncology fellow here at Penn, looking at 145 patients treated with CAR-T CAR -T therapy that was recently published in Jack Cardio-Oncology. 31 patients had a MACE event, which included de novo cardiac arrhythmias, again, primarily atrial fibrillation. The Kaplan-Meier curve for MACE at one year was 21%, with survival at one year, 71%. CRS grade higher than two, so grade three or four, baseline creatinine were both independently associated with the development of MACE. And we believe that the generation of these arrhythmias is primarily due to the cytokine storm and not directly related to the cars themselves. Now, what do we know about arrhythmias in the setting of patients who develop a chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, such as those treated with doxorubicin? So there is actually some recent data showing that the burden of arrhythmias in anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy is similar to other forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, with atrial fibrillation being most commonly identified in individuals who had implantable devices. Moreover, Dr. Herman's group from the Mayo Clinic also showed that the overall survival was not different amongst patients with an anthracycline 
mediated cardiomyopathy compared to those with other forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And that actually is a shift from earlier studies back in the early 2000s, which suggested that patients with an anthracycline mediated cardiomyopathy had worse outcomes. So what do we know specifically about the management of atrial fibrillation in cancer patients? So I'm not gonna go into anticoagulation as this can be an entire lecture unto itself, but as you will see, as it relates to rhythm control, we have a lot left to learn. So regarding DC cardioversion, we don't have a lot of data about cancer patients in general, but this was a study that looked at amyloid patients, 58 of them. Half of those patients had AL amyloid, meaning that it was malignant, and 114 matched controls, which showed that amyloid patients had a significantly higher cardioversion cancellation rate compared to control patients, and this was primarily due to the fact that left atrial appendage thrombus was more commonly seen. We know that procedural complications are also more frequent in amyloid patients compared to control patients, including Brady arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias requiring device placement. But ultimately, DC cardioversion's success rate in the acute setting, as well as arrhythmia recurrence rate, was not different between the amyloid patients and the non-amyloid patients. And what about catheter ablation? Well, this is the only study to date looking specifically at safety, and it showed that in cancer patients, the periprocedural risk of clinically relevant bleeding was more frequent than in patients without cancer, particularly when propensity score matching was performed. With that being said, there are no studies thus far specifically looking at the efficacy of catheter ablation in patients with active cancer. <clears throat> now, arrhythmias truly are a major problem in cancer patients an appropriate and long-term risk is unclear. And I think that this is an opportunity to leverage our developing technology from wearables like the Apple Watch to implantable monitors to better understand this phenomenon. And this kind of goes through the different things that as electrophysiologists, we should think about employing to better monitor for the development of arrhythmias, both in patients and survivors. And you can see wearables up to our implantable monitors can all be beneficial in this population. So what do we know about cardiac implantable devices in cancer patients? Well, well there's actually some data looking at uh, defibrillators in patients with cancer. So this was a study uh, out of Denmark, 5,600 patients with implantable defibrillators, and 5.1% of this cohort had a pre-existing diagnosis of cancer. And more than half of that population had a hospitalization for their cancer in the preceding three months before ICD uh, implantation, indicating that they had ongoing active cancer. The majority of patients had a male GU cancer, which is not surprising given the association between prostate cancer, age, and underlying cardiovascular risk. And you'll see that those cancers with very poor prognoses like pancreatic cancer had low representation in this study, which isn't surprising. Now among patients receiving primary prevention ICDs, there was no significant difference in mortality among those with or without cancer. In those patients that got a secondary prevention ICD, however, cancer was associated with a significantly higher one year and all time mortality. Now given this higher mortality, one may be tempted to state that stricter patient selection is warranted. However, if you uh, dive into the data a little bit more deeper, it's important to note that among the cancer patients who got a secondary prevention ICD, two thirds of these patients were still alive at three years and almost 60% of them received a life-saving appropriate therapy from the device. So simply having cancer should not discourage people from offering ICDs in the right clinical context. And as you can see from these bar charts, the cause of death for cancer patients with ICTs, ICDs is fairly equally distributed between cancer and cardiac causes, with the exception of all-time mortality in the primary prevention cohort in which cardiac causes are significantly more common. And the recently published Made It Chick trial that was led by Dr. Jag Singh at Mass General confirmed the benefits of cardiac resynchronization therapy in chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. In this prospective trial, 30 patients were enrolled, mean age of 64, 
73% had breast cancer, and the mean QRS duration was 152 milliseconds. All echocardiographic parameters improved after implantation, including ejection fraction going from 29% to 39%, end systolic volume of the left ventricle uh, decreasing to 89 milliliters, and left ventricular end diastolic volume decreasing to 143.2 uh, milliliters. In addition, New York Heart Association class improved in 49% with CRT implantation, and this LV ejection fraction improvement was maintained across various subgroups. And lastly, I want to touch very briefly on devices and radiation therapy. So some general principles of radiation therapy. Uh, radiation doses are measured in grays. One gray equals one joule of absorbed energy of ionizing radiation per kilogram of matter. And curative doses can exceed 80 grays for some solid tumors, with breast cancer typically receiving 50 grays and lung cancer receiving 60 to 70 grays. Now, photons uh, and electrons are most commonly used radiation particles. Particles are generated and delivered by a linear accelerator, also known as a LINAC. And at energies more than 10 megavolts, neutrons are produced by a reaction at the head of the accelerator. Now, by increasing beam energy, the depth of the radiation dose also increases. And photons in that megavolt range are used for your more deeply located tumors, whereas electrons can be used for very superficial tumors. The trouble is different energies contribute to normal tissue damage differently. Lower energies, less than 10 megavolts, use the photoelectric effect, which is in which absorption is proportional to the atomic number cubed. Higher energies, more than 10 megavolts, use the Compton effect, which is independent of the atomic number, but contributes more to neutron production. And neutrons are more damaging to devices because they are captured by the boron and lithium in memory and batteries. Now you can see that there's a variety of solid and hematologic malignancies that are treated with radiation. So this is obviously a very important part of cancer treatment. Uh, unfortunately, there's little consensus and lack of standardized guidelines to help mitigate the risk of damage to devices. And the only recommendation that each manufacturer agrees upon is the need to estimate dose prior to delivering radiation. So you can see that the challenges that exist in providing safe and effective management to patients who are undergoing radiation therapy. And then does dose even really matter? So this was a study of 569 patients with implantable devices um, and device malfunction occurred in 2.5% of individuals with pacemakers and 6.8% of individuals with ICDs. Electrical resets constituted over 78% of the malfunction, and none of the failures that were observed were life-threatening or required device removal or change. Now, interestingly, factors that were associated with malfunction included a beam energy greater than 15 megavolts, not entirely surprising um, because higher energy we know produces neutrons, which tends to damage devices. That led to a five-fold increased risk. But I think what was very interesting was the location of the tumor below the diaphragm. Uh, and why might that be, since that was further away from the device? Well, we know that tumors below the diaphragm are more deeply seated, require higher energy for radiation, which are more likely to lead to neutron production. Also interesting is the fact that absorbed dose was not associated with malfunction. So it really matters uh, the amount of energy that is delivered uh, that can lead to device malfunction. Now this is a management algorithm that I found helpful because it includes both absorbed dose and beam energy and has separate recommendations for both pacemakers and ICDs. And the take home message is that if beam energy is less than six mole, mega six megavolts, which is relatively lower energy. A patient is considered high risk only if absorbed dose is very high, more than 10 grays. If the beam energy is greater than six megavolts, however, all patients are considered at least intermediate, if not high risk, regardless of the amount of absorbed uh, energy that the device is expected to receive. And lastly, does device repositioning reduce complications? And the answer is not in most circumstances. In fact, no studies have reported that relocation is protective against malfunction from radiation. In one study of 21 patients, 
who had their devices relocated for still had malfunction. Now, if relocation had been protective, then for a fixed prescribed dose, the odds ratio should have been less than one. But in this study, it was actually 2.65 which supports the idea that other mechanisms such as beam energy contribute more to device malfunction than absorbed dose. So I would only recommend repositioning a device if the malignancy is directly posterior to device and the tumor cannot adequately be treated. So in summary, arrhythmias are a common occurrence with various cancer therapies, including BTK inhibitors and immunotherapies. Cancer patients derive similar benefits from rhythm control as non-cancer patients. So we should not only be offering them rate control. ICD and CRT therapy benefits cancer patients and survivors with cardiomyopathy. So in the right clinical context, we need to be offering patients uh, these devices. Beam energy, more so than absorbed dose, is predictive of uh, CIED malfunction. Device repositioning is rarely necessary and really should only be considered if the tumor is directly posterior to the device. And in terms of future directions, uh, I think it's important to look into ways in which we can leverage novel technology for rhythm evaluation and management so we can better assess the burden of arrhythmias in these populations. And we really need a mechanistic understanding of cancer treatment associated arrhythmogenesis as this will improve management of these conditions. And I think that was really nicely uh, evidenced by this, that recent publication circulation just this week, looking at the possible mechanism of ibrutinib associated atrial fibrillation. And again, I wanna thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity to present at the ACOS meeting this year. Uh, have a wonderful day. That was really awesome. Thank you very much. I think uh, thank you. there will be a lot of questions, but unfortunately all we can do is to send the questions to you by email and hopefully you will be able to respond in that manner. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to um, answer any emails that, that may pop up. Excellent. Now, uh, what do you think is your future direction in arrhythmias and cancer? What so, would you like to do? Right? So I, what I really think we need to do is, I'm not a basic scientist, so okay. that's one area that I think we need to definitely explore, but I need to partner with, I think, the, the basic and translational scientists to understand mechanism. Sure. Um, but from a clinical standpoint, um, I think that there's a couple of areas. One is really trying to understand um, burden of arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. And I think that's especially important um, post-treatment. So for example, um, the uh, stem cell transplant survivors, there's a lot of patients who develop atrial fibrillation. Now in the acute setting, we can't do a lot from an anticoagulation standpoint, but in the long term you know, are these patients at long-term risk of recurrent atrial fibrillation? And should we be managing them more aggressively and considering them as, as individuals who should be, you know, uh, should be anticoagulated in the long term? And then right. I think in that same vein, trying to understand what is that long-term stroke risk in that population. Awesome. Uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is a fairly standard practice uh, all across the world. And even in Asia, we have several centers that are doing uh, more than 100 transplants every year. So this is a really crucial problem. How do you think we should monitor them? Do they require of, like 24-hour ambulatory monitoring or just a regular uh, ECG or EKG is enough? Yeah, I, I think that um, that is, is to be determined. So we actually have a, um, a, a grant to uh, implant devices in uh, stem cell transplant patients. So um, link recorders, um, which as you know, are very small, they're subcutaneous, so you don't have to worry about infectious risk so that we can have more detailed uh, information about arrhythmia burden over at least a one or more year period of time. And I think having that data is gonna be important to then better assess what would be reasonable monitoring for these patients in, in you know, a real world setting. Um, I also think that perhaps 
as we get more and more individuals with um, you know, the, the different technology advances like the Apple Watch, that might become something that's very easy for people to, to utilize. Um, obviously, there's, there's cost and there's resources to be able to do that. But I, I suspect over the ensuing years, that's going to become more and more of a, of a common um, uh, modality to evaluate. Now, uh, I'm an oncologist, right? So I uh, look up to cardiologists like you to guide me. And uh, some of my cardiology colleagues say that a ventricular arrhythmia is more of a danger as opposed to an atrial arrhythmia. What are your comments on that? Yeah, I, I agree with that completely, at least in the, uh, at least in the acute setting. You know, right. what, I tell, what I always would say is that atrial arrhythmias generally don't cause harm acutely. Mm -hmm. Atrial fibrillation certainly is something we have to worry about in the long term because of that potential stroke risk, but, but people are, are going to do okay with their atrial fibrillation. Um, whereas if you see ventricular arrhythmias, we worry much more about that because that can actually translate into uh, cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. So we see it infrequently in you know, we certainly don't have as many uh, patients that develop ventricular arrhythmias with cancer therapeutics, but if we see it, it certainly begins to heighten my concern. Right. And one final question. Uh, the antiarrhythmic agents that you use are like a double-edged weapon, right? Mm -hmm. So it can actually potentially cause harm as well. So how do we balance that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a spectacular question and, 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 and one that is not easily answered. Um, you know, we will often go uh, to amiodarone as an initial choice because it is the simplest um, and tends to have uh, the least amount of acute problems. However, right. it also has the most chronic problems. So it's not something I would want to give to patients uh, initially. I think that um, that being said, because there are not a lot of uh, cardio oncologists who are also arrhythmia experts, um, there's a lot of discomfort with antiarrhythmic drugs in general. And I think that once we start thinking a little bit more broadly and having more arrhythmia experts in the mixture, I think you can start considering some of these alternative antiarrhythmic drugs, which may have fewer long-term consequences. So even though amio is what we jump to, um, I'm often considering uh, 1C agents like flecainide or propafenone, particularly in, in younger patients, say less than 50, who we wouldn't expect to have any you know, cardiac pathology um, because they tend to be a bit safer. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, mexilatine, um, for your ventricular arrhythmias. There's been some, some data actually recently which suggests that mixilatine may be um, actually useful in shortening the QT interval in patients that have drug-induced QT prolongation. So um, actually a fairly significant proportion of patients in that study were on arsenic, which as you know, significantly prolongs the QT interval. And so uh, this group of patients were given mexilatine shorten their QT interval so they could continue getting their arsenic um, and complete their APML therapy. So, you know, I think there are some really nuanced approaches. And even though AMIO is where we jump to, I think this is where it shows that this, this need for collaboration between all of the, the groups, oncologists, cardiologists, EP specialists is so, so important. Right, right. I think this is the take home message for me that when I have an uh, issue uh, with uh, arrhythmia in a, in a patient with cancer, I can't just go to any cardio oncologist. I have to search for a cardiologist who has specialized in rhythm and arrhythmia to guide me better. And I think uh, that is something that will be very useful to our uh, audience. I, I think that's, that is a, a, a fantastic take home, take home message. I agree completely. Mike, thank you very much. Your lecture is uh, recorded and I'm sure that as we show that uh, we will have a ton of questions and please permit me to forward those emails to you. Absolutely. Happy to, uh, happy to engage any questions that come through. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity and, and hopefully one day COVID will be over with and, and I, can make a, I can make a trip to India and, and do it in person. 
we will look forward to that thank you ever so much right. what, sir uh, i now request our chairperson dr raghunath rao tigamurthy uh, to please moderate the q and a is uh, dr avirup gua cardiologist from usa and also the uh, colleague of dr michael will be taking up the questions over to you sir well um, a, a good number of questions uh, since it is a reversible uh, af uh when do we stop do we change the drugs uh, do we change the chemotherapy do we change the uh, immunotherapy do we change the tyrosine kinase inhibitors does changing help actually or do we pause and then restart uh, at uh, is there any dose relationship and when actually would you like to ablate so this is from dr vivek agrawala so can we have an answer to that please uh hi can you guys hear me yes of course sir please go uh, ahead hi uh, so i am avirub gua i'm one of the cardio please. oncologists at case western i work with mike closely and um, it was great to see his talk uh, so you know this is a very nuanced question so depends on the type of af depending on the type of drug so for example i'm going to take the question from the ibrutinib standpoint because that is sort of what my research has primarily been in so ibrutinib causes atrial fibrillation in about 10% of the patients and it happens faster in patients who have pre existing history of atrial fibrillation so in those patients what we have seen is dose reduction of of ibrutinib has led to successful treatment of cll while also reducing the burden of atrial fibrillation also what we notice the the risk of stroke is lower so we just let them be in afib and then uh it, and if they don't have any other issues uh sometimes we have used various techniques like even use aspirin but the goal is always to try to put them on on chads vas therapy so now um when it comes to sort of other medications and and other issues uh you know i think we had already mentioned during our discussion that uh nuanced approaches like uh patients who take arsenic for treatment of apml for them uh qt shortening using medications like mexilitine is a is a way without reducing dosing or changing treatment to something else because we know arsenic is very effective in apml treatment so um i think it's uh, there is a lack of data to specifically mention like uh ideas which would be applicable to all patients but that's where sort of the collaboration is very helpful patient by patient thank you can we have the second question yeah um apart some pharmacolo pharmacological interventions were mentioned so when would you choose pharmacological intervention and when would you choose uh, uh, radio frequency or electro uh, ablation what so, is it uh, is it refractoriness to the pharmacological intervention or so, is it else? so i think uh, the idea over here is that uh, how symptomatic is the afib right because the first thing is that the cancer treatment needs to continue uh, as much as possible so uh, that is number one number two consideration is how symptomatic is afib because if it's an 80 year old gentleman with no symptoms from the afib then i'll just let the afib be controlled using rate control agents if it's symptomatic and then the treatment is temporary from the cancer standpoint then i will sort of hold out till the cancer treatment's done and then consider rhythm control measures um unless um now we are in a situation where um the the cancer treatment such as ibrutinib is is ongoing and they also are in afib which is symptomatic that is the type of patient which i would consider doing an ablation on and this is a clinical answer i mean uh, uh, there should be a paper coming out next year where we are looking at ablation in patients with cancer so uh, and and sort of try to answer this question with more data uh as far as drug interactions here now that is a good question so what we use in the us and i, I assume you'd probably use it in india is you'd use um uh apps like lexicomp and use uh, our pharmacy colleagues who pretty much uh, in the oncology clinics here there's always sort of a pharmacist who sort of is with the oncologist when starting medications to go over drug interactions to make sure um, all the different pathways are are addressed based on all medications they're taking so uh, that is sort of pre addressed at start of therapy and as far as holter monitoring again you know um, there has been studies proposed about holter monitoring patients with ibrutinib but um, given the outcomes are not bad even when they have afib it is not something which is a necessity it is something which uh, is done case by case more from a cardiac question standpoint rather than a, a blanket statement for monitoring 
Thank you. Do you all you always put patients on an anticoagulant if they are still asymptomatic and still have an AF? Would that uh, yes? So uh, that will be based on Chad's VASC. And you know where do we draw a cutoff and how we prevent them from bleeding? It's going to be a, a question which probably will be answered in the future because, as you know, the the scoring systems do not consider cancer as a risk factor. Neither does the Chad's VASC have it, nor does has bled have it. So uh, you cannot uh, sort of go from that standpoint, we can sort of minimize bleeding risk case by case. Uh, but uh, the the first gestalt is to prevent stroke because that is generally higher occurrence than, than bleeding. But again, you know, as I said, this is a clinical answer. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Vamsi Krishna. Uh, what all uh, about electrons uh, less than six MeV, more than six MeV was mentioned by Dr. Fradley. Does it apply to protons as well? Have you seen this with proton therapy? That's what he means. Um, you know, that's a good question. I would, I would have to defer this one to Mike. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask him this. But uh, as far as I, I remember reading his current paper, that um, overall uh, dose relationship is kind of weak because uh, nowadays uh, most radiation oncologists are pretty careful about using um, a 3D uh, mapping rather than just uh, doing... Um, uh, uh, or rather, I think they use uh, techniques called IMRT by which uh, you only radiate the part which is needed to be radiated. And some, uh, a lot of times the, the device is not in the view, uh, field of view of the radiation. So these considerations don't need as much. But as far as I, I could tell, um, most of the problems were not associated with proton therapy. So uh, just sort of by reading papers and knowing about the field, I can say that. But I, I, I will pass this question on to Mike to see if he has some more data-driven answers. Thank you very much, Dr. Guha. Uh, we shall pass on all the questions to you uh, once again through email so that you can answer and they can get back to all the listeners here and all the participants. Over to the organizers. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll move on to the next part of the session. Uh, over to the panel discussion. Our chairperson is Dr. Purna Kurkure, Senior Pediatric Oncologist from Mumbai. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us this evening. Our moderator is Dr. Rachna Seth, pediatric oncologist from New Delhi. And our panelists are Dr. Ramandeep Arora, pediatric oncologist from New Delhi, Dr. Amitabh Chattopadhyay, cardiologist from Kolkata, Dr. Sunil Bhatt, pediatric oncologist from Bangalore, Dr. Rakesh Gopal, cardiologist from Chennai, Dr. Anil Singhi, cardiologist from Gurugram, and Dr. Maya Prasad, pediatric oncologist from Mumbai. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, Rachna ma'am, are you able to hear us? Am I audible? Yes. yes. Yeah, Purna ma'am, you are audible. Okay. Good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, interesting session on pediatric oncology, survivorship and cardiotoxicity. Uh, as we all know, uh, anthracyclines form the uh, anchor of our armamentarium for uh, treatment of cancer in children. And it has been there since it's realization that it is important and it has remained so. So many other uh, anthracyclines are added to the basic doxorubicin uh, uh, besides doxorubicin, I would say. And uh, because the survival in pediatric cancer is so good uh, in excess of 80% now, that uh, this has been addressed very, very thoroughly in pediatric oncology community. Survivorship itself, childhood cancer survivorship itself has really paved the way for a lot of research in this field. And uh, there are definitive guidelines as far as uh, uh, anthracycline related cardiotoxicity, how to monitor them, how to intervene, when to intervene, there are a lot of. And it is not only the guidelines from various groups, that is children's oncology group or European groups, but there is a, even an effort towards the harmonization of these guidelines. And I'm sure we will uh, bring up these uh, uh, issues during our uh, panel discussion, which will be led by Dr. Rajna Sheikh. She is a professor of uh, pediatric oncology in the Department of Pediatrics at uh, All India Institute of Medical Science and has a special interest and 
leads our uh, late effect uh, group of uh, Indian Pediatric Oncology uh, group, which is a research and study group uh, at the national level. So over to you, Dr. Rachna Sheikh, for conducting this uh, interesting panel discussion. Dr. Rachna? Uh, Rachna, you left to unmute. Yeah, yeah. Unmute yeah. yourself, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hello. Is it, am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible okay. and your okay. screen is also shared. Okay. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you. And good evening to everybody. At the outset, I thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to moderate this session. So just to introduce the topic, pediatric cardio-oncology is a rapidly growing field aimed, which is actually primarily aimed at minimizing the effects of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in children who are receiving cancer treatment, as well as those who enter into survivorship. So to meet this aim, uh, the patients are assessed at baseline to define their cardiovascular risk, and then they are followed up systematically during their survivorship for any cardiovascular uh, disease that have to be have uh, that develop. It's essentially a teamwork, primarily comprising of cardiologist, oncologist, or a hematologist. Primarily aim being to for prevention, early detection, and management of various cardiovascular diseases in these patients. This field is rapidly growing particularly with the recognition that many agents that we use that are effective for cancer therapies leave our survivors for potential risk of various cardiovascular diseases. To compound this fact, it's, it's not only the chemotherapy, but also the radiation that plays its uh, role and, has, and takes a toll on these patients. The spectrum of various cardiovascular diseases is protein, varying from various cardiovascular complications like heart failure, coronary artery disease, uh, peripheral vascular diseases, valvular heart diseases, to name a few. All this has culminated in emergence of a specialized uh, speciality of cardio-oncology, leading to the development of various cardio-oncology clinics in certain centers. So with this background, I open the uh, panel uh, for uh, discussion. And the flow of this would be that I'll be posing some factual uh, questions to the esteemed panelists. Uh, and then I'll be discussing two case scenarios. So the first question to Dr. Amitabha Chattopadhyay would be that what do you understand by the term cancer therapeutics related cardiac dysfunction, CTRCD? How do you define and what are the types of uh, CTRCD? And how do you understand the mechanism? Good evening, madam. I'm Dr. Amitabha. I'm a pediatric cardiologist. Uh, thank you very much for incorporating us to uh, this uh, August program. Now, the very, uh, at the very start, I'd like to say that there are several definitions for the question which I have asked. And the, the very fact that there are several definitions for this one, uh, uh, I mean, uh, estimates the fact that there, there is some ambiguity in the definitions. So there are several ones, like the first one comes from the American Society, that's the AAC and the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging, where the definitions are, as per that, if there is more than 10% decline in the ejection fraction to a final value of less than 53% on subsequent imaging, which may be performed approximately about two to three weeks gap after the initial measurement. The baseline measurement is essential before starting the therapy. Or if it is more than 50% relative decline in the global longitudinal strain, there's a GLS compared to the baseline. Here again, we do a baseline study for the GLS. The second definition comes from the FDA, which was in particular for the doxorubicin and doxorubicin mediated cardiotoxicity which is more than 20% absolute decline in the ELVEF, or more than 10% decrease in ELVEF to less than the lower limit of normal or any value which is absolutely more than less than 25%. The third definition is particularly related to trust to ZMMA, which is mediate cardiomyopathy was either 10% more than 10% decline in the absence of symptoms and in the presence of symptoms more than 5% decrease or if the final value is less than 55%. Next one, please. And if we continue our definitions, the National Cancer Institute is the NCI. They have a five-stage definition. There is a common terminology criteria for advanced defense. There is a CTCAE, where they have graded from one to five. The grade one is asymptomatic elevations in biomarkers or abnormalities on imaging. For example, if we do a 2D, I mean 2D uh, echocardiogram, we find 
abnormality or even on H3D or stream patterns or inhibitions in biomarkers like CKMB or some troponin TRI. Grades two and three, there are consist of symptoms with mild and moderate exertion. Grade four includes severe life-threatening symptoms requiring hemodynamic support where the oncology patient is actually in close liaison with the cardiology department and needs some inpatient therapy. And grade five involves death. Coming to the next part of the question, that is the types of cardiotoxicity. Type one is usually seen classically with the anthracyclines, is believed to be irreversible, dose-related, caused by the free radical formation, oxygen stress, and myofibular disarray. And type two is seen traditionally with the use of trastuzumumab, which is believed to be reversible and not dose-related, no accompanied ultrastructural abnormalities. But this distinction may be more complicated and more uh, than once perceived because it might may not take the rule and there are exception, more exceptions than rules. Improvements in anthracycline induced cardiac dysfunction with heart failure therapy, it has been seen often occurring, though on irreversible scar formation on MRI are found with trastuzumab. Anthracycline toxicity can further be defined as acute, which occurs in less than 1% of the patients with a transient decline in myocardial contractility, which often recovers when you discontinue the medication for some time and again reconfirm it after some time. And the chronic ones, that is about 1.6 to 5% of patients, which occurs more than one year of therapy completion, more than one year after the completion of therapy. And the cancer agents, the question was that how do they cause the cardiotoxicity? There are several modalities of uh, action where there, there is LV dysfunction, heart, frank heart failure presentations with arrhythmias, which Dr. Mike was telling about, and the ischemias. There are several theories like impaired protein synthesis or DNA repair, inhibition of the several pathways, coronary vasospasm, which might be temporary or permanent, impaired microtubular functions, or interference with the cell cycle degradation products, or reactive oxygen species formations, and so on and so forth. So the second question would be to our uh, second cardiologist. So Dr. Rakesh, what would be the spectrum of cardiotoxic drugs? And are all drugs equally cardiotoxic or some would be more? And what is the impact of combination treatment of chemotherapy along with radiotherapy? Dr. Rakesh, are you there? Uh, Rakesh, sir, you'll have to unmute your mic. Now, now I'm audible now? Yes. Yeah. See, all the drugs are not equally cardiotoxic. And if you look at the older generation of the chemotherapeutic drugs, only the I mean, other cyclines and cyclophosphamide is supposed to cause uh, significant cardiac uh, uh, toxicity in the multivariate analysis. However, uh, using any chemo drug can cause uh, clinically in many people uh, LV dysfunction. This may not be really related only to the cardiotoxicity of the drugs. Many patients can actually get a stress induced cardiomyopathy. And uh, when Asli clearly mentioned, uh, there are two types of uh, cardiomyopathies. I do not go to that again. However, uh, uh, the different types of chemo drugs, the cardiotoxicity varies from LV dysfunction, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, as we uh, spoke about, about uh, some of these uh, TKIs, and also the arsenic, uh, which was not mentioned in the, those talk. But still, I um, mean, at least 50% uh, of the patients who are on arsenic will develop prolonged QTC more than 500 milliseconds during the, during, during the course. Uh, there are significant arrhythmias, including bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias associated with immunotherapy and myocarditis. They do have very bad outcome. In such patients, the therapy cannot be restarted. And uh, if you use a combination of the drug, if you if patient initially has received uh, anthracycline, and subsequently if the patient has to receive uh, trastuzumab, then the risk of toxicity really is much more, it's about 2.7 times much more than the, the basic drug of address, I mean, the cycle alone. Having said that, the trastuzumab induced cardiomyopathy is reversible except in one person. The combination therapy with uh, when any patient who has got a radiation along with the chemotherapy, the overall risk of developing LV dysfunction is about 2.7% uh, by the end of uh, 30 years. Uh, but if the agent uses an anthracycline and for, with the radiation uh, which is involved in the heart, then the risk uh, is about 18% at about 20 years. Uh, if, if, if the radiation was limited to 0.7 gray, sorry, 3.7 gray, uh, when the radiation doses increases, when, 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 when the radiation do, do, dose is much more, and when it reaches about 25 gray, the uh, risk of cardiac toxicity is very high if, if, uh, if you use a combination therapy. Uh, of especially anthracycline with uh, radiation. 
Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir, it is actually very important for all pediatric oncologists to realize that it is not only anthracyclines. So our understanding about cholitoxic drugs is really expanding. So it's all even alkylating agents like hydrocyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, platinum compounds, imatinib, TKI inhibitors that we use. So all these actually are highly, highly cardiotoxic. So yes, the spectrum of knowledge about cardiotoxic drugs is increasing. And also, you rightly said that, of course, uh, less lower dose become cardiotoxic once we couple with, a, uh, with some dose of uh, radiation to the chest. So we move on to the next question to Dr. Anil Singhi, who is also our uh, cardiologist participating here. So, uh, Dr. Anil, regarding the baseline evaluation for cardiac function before starting treatment, how do you guide your pediatric oncologist? There are a lot of considerations and the modalities available are sort of very varied. So, how do you guide your pediatric oncologist as to what would be the ideal investigations at baseline? Thank you, madam. And good evening, madam. Uh, and all uh, renowned oncologists and cardiologists in the forum, it's my pleasure. And it, Dr. Amitabha and Dr. Rakesh Gopal already set the stage and they discussed the basic part. Whenever we want to decide that heart is not performing at par, we should know the baseline. So next slide, I wish to highlight some important fact. Next slide, madam. Hello? Yes, Am I audible? audible? Yes, you audible. Uh, next slide, yes. So that the traditional comfort zone, what we used to do see earlier that we are heavily dependent on left ventricular ejection fraction. Uh, which is a load dependent parameter of cardiac function. We in the present era have come out of that because cardiac function is more diverse and the chemotherapy in the present era have multitude of action and the sequel of chemotherapy that's why require a more robust evaluation by a cardiologist and it require a team effort team effort from oncologist to cardiologist, the cardiology team should know what is the plan. If we see the uh, chemotherapy action, the big chart, but the essence is there are various group of agents which uh, act on different chambers and layers of the heart. For example, LV function, one group of drugs, LV diastolic function, there are specific agents, uh, LV mass reduction caused by say anthracycline, Right ventricle also is uh, specifically targeted by agents like tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Some agents act on valves like anthracycline or some are very predisposed to cause arrhythmia as uh, the keynote address nicely redressed the point. Some pericardial. So the whole intent to show this picture, this picture ideally should be in the uh, room of the pediatric cardio oncology assessment because it's difficult to remember which drug is going to do what harm. We should know this drug is going to affect this segment of the heart so that baseline will be more evaluating in details. Next, please. Next, madam. And some agents, there was discussion already that some are more toxic to the heart like anthracycline and some are very less like etoposide. The list is long, but most essential thing, we should know which drug is going to heart, heart more and they are high risk group. So baseline X-ray tells us about the heart size and heart lung interaction. ECG is now very important for two reasons. It indicates hypertrophy, cardiac dysfunction, also the low voltage complexes or arrhythmias, atrial or ventricular. Beyond ejection fraction now, the Dr. Amitabha has nicely told the strain imaging has come in long way. Mm, circumferential strain reportedly more predictive though the definition talked about longitudinal strain. If we know the baseline, then only we'll be able to know how much it has declined. The diastolic function, some agents specifically affect, though it is tricky to assess in the kids, but we should try to enumerate the diastolic function at baseline. As well, as well as the LV mass because reduction in the maximal oxygen consumption and reduced physical exercise capability can be known by that. RV function, some drugs, as I told, 33% of the cases RV is involved, which is not routinely assessed in any regular uh, assessment of the heart. So we should know the drug and we should assess RV uh, independently. Next, please. Cardiac MRI is a gold standard uh, to assess cardiac function, uh, which can be done only cases which are considered more uh, risky 
or has some damage uh, logistics and cost and interpretation of the cardiac mr uh, require more expertise so specific institute with that expertise can go for it uh, multi gated acquisition scan that muga scan is losing its preference because it is more load dependent because it relies on the ejection fraction it has more cost uh, than echocardiography and strain imaging so eco plus cmr has taken over that coming to biomarker two biomarkers which are more relevant bnp now it is for cardiomyopathy in pediatric age group we are routinely using bnp as baseline as well as to monitor the therapy so it is very useful uh, for uh, trop i it is more specifically for anthracycline toxicity so is the echocardiogram strain imaging and biomarker in combination will help us to early detect the subclinical disease when we know uh, thank the you for the uh, thank you um, dr rachna and um, i i think we've had a very good background so far so we already know that uh, there are certain doses uh, the cardiac toxicity of anthracyclines is uh, quite dose dependent so we generally um, try not to give up give above a certain dose uh, there are various protocols mentioned different doses uh, so around 250 to 300 Uh, mg per meter square might be taken as the capping dose so in a treatment naive patient of course we would um, start off with whatever protocol we are planning to do while monitoring uh, for cardiac toxicity periodically according to the protocol so if it's doxorubicin generally at our center we do it every two cycles or around 100 to 120 mg per meter square uh, dose of doxorubicin each time the patient gets so much of a dose we do an echocardiography to look for cardiac toxicity so generally the cumulative doses of protocols do not ex exceed beyond 300 or 350 except probably in osteogenic sarcoma where some protocols give even up to 450 mg per meter square the second in a relapse setting it's very important to see all the cumulative doses of uh, cardiac uh, cardio toxic drugs that they have received so different anthracyclines have got di different um, levels of cardio toxicity doxorubicin uh, being the most cardio toxic agent among the commonly used anthracyclines so we look at the uh, cumulative dose which has been received so far and if it does not exceed the capping dose that we want to give we can give that much more of um, anthracyclines with echocardiographic monitoring if it's really necessary to give more uh, more of the anthracyclines we should do it under a uh, very regular and uh, careful cardiac monitoring Okay, thank you. So I think we need to go fast uh, because uh, the organizers have already indicated that we have about twelve minutes, I think, remaining now. So, Dr. Sunil Bhar, the next question comes to you. How in your center are you providing cardio oncology services? Can you just be brief and to the point? Uh, so, thank you for for the question, and I think I'll be very brief. Yeah. Uh, you know, being a large cardiac center, you know, associated with our hospital, which is Narayana Health City, Bangalore. um you know we are kind of i would say privileged uh, so this uh, you know um, I, i you know in a good cardio oncology service uh, you know whether it's pediatric or adult i think there are three components to it and that is uh, of course the teamwork between the pediatric oncology team and the pediatric cardiology team along with the diagnostic facilities which has been uh, you know very uh, uh, lucidly put put forward as uh, biomarkers and imaging whether it is echo or an mri being the two common ones being used so i think we're blessed to have all of these in house uh, you know uh, we work very closely with the pediatric oncology and we're and we're also lucky that you know one of the pediatric uh, cardiologists uh, is uh, in, you know a special interest is um, uh, cardio oncology and that kind of helps and drives the whole Uh, team uh, to uh, you know in in this field um so you know we have developed a system which i uh, find is you know I, i want to share what we do and also what we want to do which which is not happening at the, at the moment and i think is ideal to do uh, what we do is that we will give a baseline information to the cardiologist diagnosis how much uh, what uh, you know uh, cardio toxic drugs the patient is on uh, how much dose has been planned in the protocol and what has the patient already received Uh, till that that goes in the referral sheet uh, to the, the pediatric cardiologist and uh, of course they you know will do uh, you know uh, you know a couple of years we have been trying we're doing the stress echo now the 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 strain echo the speckle echo uh, which I, i think is helping them to make uh, good uh, you know uh, objective assessments 
of of the cardiac functions and including other you know investigations which they feel you know sometimes mris and other things especially before uh, uh, bone marrow transplantation patients are taken they would prefer to do that um and uh, and that information is fed back to us uh, and uh, and depending on the protocol and depending on the cardiac dysfunction the the changes are being made so that's what we do at the moment i think over there i feel there are a couple of things which we kind of ideally should happen one one thing i think which i which we i think are missing and probably some of the other centers may also be missing is that's the continuation see a patient uh, you know for example osteosarcoma the patient may have five or six echoes during the treatment and of course there will be echoes in the follow up and the survivorship also uh, we don't we have these loose sheets of paper and you know they may be put in the in the file somewhere but i think what's what probably is important is to uh, is to tabulate that relevant information and then you can see the trends and the changes i think that's what something which we are planning now to implement so that in 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 a glance you will come to know what has happened over a period of time uh, and that gives a trend which is very important you know which has been highlighted earlier and uh, the second is in the in the survivorship i think in our uh, you know uh, survivors clinics still we refer the patients to the pediatric hall they see them and send them back i think we want to do that in which is probably ideal is to do in one clinic uh, where the where all of you sit together and and see the patient uh, on your survivorship you know clinic days and that happens kind of under under one roof in one clinic and that that's something also we are not doing at the present that i think ideally should be done Thank okay, you. Thank you, and thank you for really highlighting that point. That trends of changes are uh, are very very important to pick up subtle changes that guides the treatment subsequently. So the next question is to Dr. Ramandeep. So at your center, is there is it somewhat different to what Dr. Sunil Bhat had uh, follow uh, had just uh, narrated? Would you want to highlight uh, any changes that you do at your center? And then, what are the principles of dose modification? If you pick up any dysfunction during therapy, whether it is subclinical or it is overt, quickly can we have the answers yeah, so that we can move to the cases? Thank you so much. Um, the I mean, I whatever Sunil said is uh, similar to what we would do. Uh, there have been various um, protocols, probably COG recommendation, most widely followed about how often you should do the uh, cardiac function assess uh, assessment in. Uh, survivors but also during treatment uh, baseline then in the middle and towards the end um, so for patients who are receiving say 50 to 100 to 150 mg per meter square of anthracyclines combined we would do one in the beginning and one in the end for those like aml and osteosarcoma who get up to 400 450 mg per meter square we would do one at halfway as well and the assessment is only by echo Uh, and nothing else that is my personal practice with regards to dose modification uh, in my experience uh, we have never so far encountered an acute deterioration in such a situation our det deterioration is seen either 6 months to 1 year after end of treatment in aml patients or then further down the line for survivors so personally i have not had to modify treatment except for one child who had a congenital heart disease and had received um, anthracyclines and then had fluid overload where we had to um, stop the anthracycline thank you okay thank you so should i just cover these you have already sort of highlighted this could i just uh, would you want to some say something on these yeah, i i just for sake of time i didn't touch on it as dr purna mentioned in the beginning there are these uh, international guidelines. harmonization guidelines Which? and if you go to the previous slide currently this is the a uh, belief in the community which is the highest risk group is more than 250 mg per meter square of anthracycline alone or with radiation the threshold comes down and uh, as you can see there are low moderate and high risk groups next slide please and with regards to recommendation previously we used to do two yearly three yearly etc but now they recommend five yearly follow up after with the first echo done within the two years of end of treatment and uh, generally echo is the recommended um, investigation recognizing its limitations other investigations like the ones mentioned by the cardiologist earlier in the session are uh, useful in scenarios where it's either part of a study or academic setting etc uh, thank you okay so uh, we move on to our first and this is a very interesting case it is a real case scenario which we had encountered it's a 11 year old boy diagnosed to have a b lineage acute lymphoblastic leukemia and was a high risk disease uh, was also cns disease positive was treated on anthracycline based chemotherapy reg regime and was admitted for an episode of febrile neutropenia 
So first week of illness, his uh, pro BNP was to the tune of almost sixteen hundred. Ejection fraction was normal. GLS was normal. By second week of illness, he was admitted with us. His ejection fraction fell to forty six percent. GLS dropped to almost fourteen point six percent, and he was febrile with markers. Biomarkers of sepsis were positive. So what would we do in this situation? There are a lot of questions, interactions at this point of time. So Dr. Maya, quickly to the uh, point, could you tell us the interplay of infection, cancer and cardiotoxicity, the link? Then can pro-BNP rise even without cardiac dysfunction? What are the other causes of rise of pro-BNP? We often see this situation in our clinical scenario. And then what is the pediatric data of cardiac biomarkers and cardiac dysfunction? Could we just have very, very crisp answers from you? Yes, so um, septic cardiac dysfunction is uh, relatively a common scenario, especially in cases like ALL induction when uh, blood cultures are positive. And um, in most cases, they actually resolve, although they may require a lot of treatment interruption. Patient might be very sick and often in the ICU. So we just need to uh, treat the infection and support the cardiac function by either giving uh, dobutamine or giving enalapril, whatever is the depending on what is the uh, cardiac function at that point of time. Uh, so uh, cardiac biomarkers may rise even before the cardiac uh, dysfunction is clinically noticed. So that is the utility of these cardiac biomarkers. But generally, I mean, it needs to be used in conjunction. As everyone else said, it needs to be used in conjunction with um, the clinical as well as the echocardiographic findings. Uh, personally, I don't have that much experience with that. Um, with cardiac biomarkers, but the pediatric data, data on cardiac biomarkers is still not 100% conclusive for us to use it in day-to-day -day practice. Um, drop, drop, uh, drop T is useful mainly in acute, but the, most of the studies come from adults, and uh, NT pro BNP is usually seen in um, asymptomatic, asympt it is actually useful in asymptomatic survivors of childhood cancer in order to develop uh, C the um, developing late cardiotoxicity. So, thank you. And in our, uh, we've also. Doctor Rajna, I will just add one point. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That if yes, you have such an episode or yes, event during the course of the treatment, yes, these children are more liable. These are generally reversible. As you control yes. the sepsis, the cardiac function improves. But this should be very well documented that you had this event. Because mm -hmm. when they become survivors, they can have a more probability of uh, developing late cardiotoxicity and uh, they should be washed more carefully. That's the only thing which... Yes, very true, ma'am. And this is actually what even we follow at our center. All sepsis episodes, all febrile neutropenia episodes, these children are very closely monitored for any evidence of cardiac dysfunction. This is what lately we've also started been doing. So this child, we started him on cardio protection in the form of a beta blocker as well as uh, ACE inhibitor. By fourth week of his illness, his uh, pro-BNP uh, fell down, ejection fraction normalized, but GLS was still to the tune of about 14%. Chemotherapy was restarted, uh, anthocyclines were resumed under cardio protection, and this child is do was doing well. So my question to Dr. Sunil would be that, uh, would you have managed this child in a different way? Um, so, you know, a uh, couple of points here. One is that I think you mentioned earlier, it's a high risk disease. And we know that anthracycline is a very important component in the induction treatment of this child. That is one point. Second is that I think there has been a clear cut history of febrile neutropenia and a septic illness. And, and, the, and I'm, I'm in the cardiologist and probably uh, throw some more light. And the, and the reversibility has been pretty, pretty fast. You know, the child has recovered very quickly once the sepsis has come under control. So I agree that, you know, we should continue uh, anthracycline because it's an important part of the treatment and it looks like, uh, you, you know, the trigger has been here, a, a septic illness and uh, because the high-risk disease. Uh, now, I think uh, I, I think the, the question here would be that cardiac protection for how long? Um, I, 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 again, you know, the cardiologist can probably comment, but I think I would pr prefer because this child is going to have maybe multiple episodes of febrile neutropenia during the treatment. There is another, uh, you know, a round of anthracycline to be given later on in this treatment. So I would pro probably prefer um, the cardiac protection to be continued uh, for for the for the next few months till the child, uh, you know, finishes the intensive treatment of, of induction consolidation and extract uh, um, till the patient goes on maintenance, and then probably with the cardiologist, so, you know, uh, 
with their inputs probably we can uh, think of uh, you know um, stopping and tapering of the cardiac protection uh, you know to make a point on the the the, the cardiac biomarkers i think uh, you know doc there there's data on pediatrics in two settings one is the uh, what what dr purna was uh, mentioning is uh, is is the uh, the predictive value of th those in, in, you know increased cardiac biomarkers um, in acute settings has of course if there even if there's reversibility has been later on shown to be uh you know uh, leading to cardiac dysfunction later on the survivorship that's number one and number two it's also a good uh, uh, marker for uh, for follow ups and and the trends over a period of time uh, you know is is important we really don't know in other settings how this will help you know uh, but these are the two settings where the cardiac bypass has been shown to be valuable in in pediatric uh, setting thank you very much yeah, thank you so six weeks for on follow up uh, down the line all his parameters reverted in between he's had a few episodes of hyperneutropenia however has had no episodes of decompensation we continued him on cardio protection and he's still uh, doing so and doing well on chemotherapy dr ramandi would you, uh, the question is partly answered would you defer because this question was for you how long would you continue cardio protection any comment on that or would you do you agree with what dr sunil has said Uh, no, I agree with Dr. Sunil. Um, there is, I would ask my cardiologist. I would let them guide me and uh, continue treatment. Yeah, at our center, generally we are our advice from our cardiologist is that we continue because, particularly even with anthracycline, initially if it affects the cardiotoxicity is reversible, but in a setting where anthracyclines are given and sepsis occurs uh, repeatedly, then the advice is and what we are following at our center is that we give them a prolonged course. of cardio protection throughout the episode of uh, throughout the course of uh, chemotherapy yeah, if you have used adriamycin uh, then the the cardio protective drugs has to be given life term yes yes because we agree because course. particularly with anthracyclines yeah. it is said because of type of cardio toxicity uh, the type 1 it generally causes type 1 cardio toxicity where it is said that you need to give them life term but also i think the data is there to suggest that early onset a uh, cardiac toxicity with anthracyclines is said to be reversible also whereas yes. with later onset it can be irreversible so i think that data will emerge for children i think it is it's going to be some time before we have some robust data as to how these children will behave so dr anil singh quickly can you tell us what is subclinical cardiac toxicity and uh, uh, i think it has partly been reflected yes, yes i think already dr amita bo has touched so, on that i think that so. no symptom and uh, developing strain imaging is that yeah, very good modality Uh, which can predict in your index case also it has helped and yes. strain imaging along with bnp that collaboratively can best be evaluated yes okay thank you dr ramandeep uh, so pediatric data on anticipating cardiac dysfunction during chemotherapy using gls uh, eco or biomarkers would you want to comment on this i i wish i could i, I just don't have the knowledge about this um so you know uh, what is the role of these uh, echo findings and biomarkers for anticipating cardiac dysfunction so any cardiologist would want to comment on gls uh, so gls uh, gls is actually a very good modality to detect early onset of cardiac dysfunction before the overt uh, drop in ejection fraction of cells but the problem here is like you no know, gls has not made a big difference in terms of uh, outcomes the reason is uh, all the therapies for heart failure works by manipulating the neurohormonal axis by the interrupting the renin angiotensin and aldosterone axis so when gls is abnormal this uh, parameters are not altered so if you give cardioprotective drugs with the presence of mere gls abnormality drug reduction the gls it may not lead to an outcome uh, measures but we will know this patient is going towards developing a lordy function but gls is very important in one particular setting it is the immunotherapy in immunotherapy uh, many patients will have normal ejection fraction with frank heart failure 50% of the patients with on immunotherapy related uh, myocarditis will have normal ejection fraction and 30% of the patients who had major cardiac events itself will have still normal ejection fraction but gls will be abnormal in up to 90% of the patients with immunotherapy related uh, myocarditis so this is something which you can really use in clinical scenario yeah. as of now Yes. Right now, madam, uh, sincere apologies, but we are run out of time. Uh, okay, can I sure. ask you to just conclude instead of asking panelists so, any more questions? Okay. So can we just quickly can I go through this? This is survival. No, I think so, you should stop the case presentation. Just give the points that you want to cover. Okay. So uh, I think I'll just then. Uh, uh i'll just quickly i would want to really highlight these issues which are important for a survivor patient because we are having really the 
uh, the number of long term survivors of pediatric cancer survivors are really increasing so these long term follow up guidelines would be very important so dr maya would you just reflect on these published guidelines quickly because of or particularly pertinent to a survivor yes uh, i think uh, uh, ramandeep already went through them yeah. so the igg guidelines are the most current ones and uh, they are currently even being updated so uh, and they're also available on uh, lancet oncology so uh, i think in the interest of time we can uh, okay so dr ramandeep uh, would you want to reflect on indian data particularly and the spectrum of cardiotoxicity for particularly relevant to our childhood cancer survivors this is an important aspect just the organizers i request you just give us 2 minutes because this would really have important messages to give to our audience dr ramandeep please so we we are fortunate that there are multiple large cohorts across the world which are collecting data and over a period of 10 20 30 40 50 years they have shown that the uh, magnitude of the problems of the heart keep increasing next slide please and uh, Aman, without... can i can i please interrupt Uh, whatever please. you want to do we will uh, please do it without slides you have 60 okay. seconds from okay. okay right i'll okay. just uh, uh, yeah, just leave it over here so just yeah. to finally say that uh, in india dr rachna has started the uh, cohort for survivors in pediatric oncology uh, around 10 20 centers are contributing data we have recently reviewed the literature from indian co- st- uh, studies and there are three studies including dr karpurkar's study the dr said study which talk about cardiac dysfunction uh, our plan is now future prospectively collect data from the country and give better evidence of what the problem is and how to deal with it thank you okay uh, i'll skip this part because uh, oh, in, uh, we taking the uh, taking the consideration of shortage of time but definitely our counseling is very important for our childhood cancer survivors so we want to counsel our survivors for the type of cardiotoxicity for a duration of cardio protection importance of lifestyle changes the uh, risk factors that are implicated all this becomes very important once we counsel our survivor at treatment completion so with this uh, with this discussion i would uh, thank the organizers and would want to give this message that cardiotoxicity is an important and a common adverse effect of many of our treatments that we give and uh, an understanding of onco cardiology or we can say onco cardio oncology is critical for effective management of our child ca- our childhood cancer patients particularly for a fruitful or a well uh, survivorship thank you Uh, thank you so much ma'am i now request our chairperson to please moderate the q and a's uh, ma'am request you to be uh, we'll have 5 minutes for the session would you yes yes i i know we have encroached on the time so we will have fewer questions uh, there is a question from dr vivek agarwal i have a pediatric cardiologist yeah i think ma'am can skip the question i think this is not ha. important ha no generally we are not using it next question please how should we decide on fitness of anthracyclines in a pediatric patients with congenital heart disease this is a very practical question because congenital heart disease is quite common entity one in 140 children uh, one uh, can have a congenital heart disease so uh, your cancer patient that you are handling can have it can, is any panelist going to answer uh, congenital heart disease when we tell it is a broad spectrum and the, uh, the Sixty to seventy percent will have a simpler heart disease like a ventricular septal defect or atrial septal defect, and some of them will be a post-operative patient. Usually, cardiac functions will be normal in that substrate. Uh, then that should not bar for using this anthracycline group of drugs. Only uh, cardiac dysfunction in complex cyanotic heart disease or heart disease with multiple element. can have that barring uh, otherwise i think in an individual case congenital heart disease uh, is not a bar for using anthracycline or even uh, or even maybe the, or even maybe the medications may be modified to some extent especially like children in down syndrome where you might get a congenital heart disease and some uh, I mean cancer at the same time so this might be examples where you might have to modify your medications yeah. there is a question from dr vamshi says that does rt cause dysfunction to coronaries or to myocardium and can children do dibh anyone to answer that question i think yes. the answer, simple answer to the question this question is RT both definitely causes a uh, damage to the coronary arteries which manifest later we always says that the 
uh, organ senescence comes earlier in uh, survivors of childhood cancer and the coronaries are one of the very leading example of that early senescence and particularly if they have received the anthracycline and radiotherapy now again from dr vivek agarwal are there any drugs that preferentially affect the rv right, right yes right. yes i think uh, in the chart i mentioned tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, anthracycline and radiotherapy these are the three agents mentioned specifically affecting rv Uh, they found a, a RV dysfunction in that group, but it is mentioned in literature. Uh, this is an interesting question from Dr. Gauri Kapoor. What is equivalence of doxorubicin versus mitoxantron for cardiotoxicity? Uh, because uh, doxorubicin is a standard of care, uh, but if there is a relapse situation, other anthracyclines are used. So, uh, any any of Dr. Maya or uh, Dr. Arora, anyone to answer this? What is the equivalence? Generally, mitoxantron upfront is not very commonly used entity, except in some of the AML protocols. AML, AML, AML yeah. protocols. AML yes, protocols. Yes. AML protocols. Yes. Dr. Yes, Purna, now obviously with icicle, mitoxantron is now part of the upfront uh, randomized question. Um, the uh, I think Maya had mentioned that's around four to five times the equivalence. Although I have put a paper over there which shows that it may be as high as ten times uh, because of its effects on the heart. So the final answer is not yet known. It is also part of the relapse protocols, ma'am, these days. Uh, and what we have been doing is five times the doxorubicin. But I I need to go through what uh, what uh, you know uh, uh, what Raman has put. Five is what we have been taking. Uh, yeah, but I think the current uh, and, one. What yeah. um, Raman said is the current one. Yes. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Vivek again. What is the recommendation for further exposure to anthracycline in such patients recover from sepsis-related CMP? Cardiomyopathy. So I think the answer to this question is probably not known. Um, you know, common sense would say that uh, we may have to do you know dose reduction, uh, but I think that's a very very uh, subjective assessment. Uh, i think uh, if there's a complete recovery as we just discussed the case it may be worthwhile to uh, keep a close eye continue the cardiac protection uh, and weigh the risk benefit of uh, reducing the dose or omitting anthracycline based on the disease status but of no, course just, if, if, uh, yeah. Yeah. most of these patients who receive anthracyclines they have myocardial necrosis but the heart pump failure is eminently treatable so in our experience we have been we have been treated with anthracycline to almost every patient We have had a little dysfunction related to anthracyclines. It is possible and feasible because patients need a cure for cancer. You can't stop it. Yeah, I also agree, ma'am. Because in our patients, in our set of patients, to those who had cardiac dysfunction, have been put on cardio protection, and we are able to their LV function reverts to normal, and we are actually continuing with their chemotherapy. That is actually the objective of of cardio oncology that we. take care of their cardiac dysfunction and give them the optimum doses of chemotherapy so that is what our aim is and that is what we are targeting and possibly we are able to do that we are reintroducing our uh, chemotherapy without any dose for alteration but, now, but i think it becomes a little difficult later on once uh, you know if it's late in the disease process you know you have crossed 250 300 that's, and that's then true. then that, it becomes yeah. quite so quite difficult so cumulative doses would definitely make a difference but this is in the initial phases generally phases the problem occurs easy. in the initial phases of induction and the initial cycles of uh, you know of these leukemia so that is you are talking of the initial phases where chemotherapy is more intensive the cardiologist is not here to say no to chemotherapy yeah you have to support your chemotherapy yeah. that's the objective yeah uh, we have to remember one fact that any uh, toxicity particularly the late toxicity is an interaction between a host the treatment and the disease factor so there are inherent uh, genetic factors also which contribute to cardiac toxicity in the terms of polymorphism and if you have some unusual uh, case one must start thinking there is lot being done in cardio toxicity anthracycline or any other uh, chemotherapy induced cardio toxicity and particularly in children that uh, we must think about it and go into the details uh, if you have a cardio toxicity which is rather unusual we have seen at tata hospital i had seen lot of correlation between ewing sarcoma 
uh, and the cardiotoxicity at the same level of anthracycline uh, cumulative dose. So one needs to go. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Kurkure. Uh, okay. It's 8:25 p.m. We are already quite late. We'll move on to the next session. Uh, thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you to everyone. Uh, we'll move on to the panel uh, case presentation. Our chairperson for the session is Dr. Hari Menon, medical oncologist from Bangalore. Thank you so much, sir, for chairing the session. Uh, we request you to please introduce our case presenter. Over to you, sir. Uh, Hari, sir, you'll have to unmute your mic. Uh, so I'll just, uh, due to want of time, I'll just introduce our case presenter. Our case presenter for the session is Dr. Hisham Ahmed, cardiologist from Kochi. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, perfectly well. Yeah, 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 thank you. So since we're running short of time, I think I'll just uh, rapidly dive into our case. So uh, so this case is a bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel, um, as probably uh, we will see. Um, at the end of the uh, clinical journey of this particular patient. So diving into the history, so our patient is a 67-year-old male um, with a comorbidity of uh, diabetes and with no family history of uh, renal disease or heart disease. And his presentation was with... Um, yeah, so his presentation was with progressive breathlessness on exertion, which was noted in the early part of 2018, uh, which rapidly progressed uh, over the subsequent month. And he presented with the worsening of his NYHA class of breathlessness and presence of um, swelling of the feet. At this point in time, he had consulted a physician at his, uh, at his local hospital and he was treated with diuretics and bronchodilators. He obtained some form of relief. Um, but then it was not uh, maintained. It was not a sustained uh, response. And um, he presented with anasarca. He reported almost seven kilograms of weight gain, orthopnea, and one episode of syncope. And this is where he presented to us in March 2018, uh, where he came with admission uh, with worsening of his um, symptoms. So coming to the uh, just uh, highlights of the physical examination. So he had an elevated JVP. There were significant crepitations in the bilateral lung fields. He had a left ventricular S4 on the cardiovascular examination, and he had hepatomegaly and uh, clinical ascites was detected. In terms of vital signs, he had a heart rate of around 90 beats per minute. He was regular. regular. He has a blood pressure of 110 over 70, and notably, there was no significant uh, postural hypotension. He was saturating okay with a 98% um, SpO2 at room air, but the respiratory rate was 20 per minute, tachypnic on admission. So quickly going to some of the baseline labs, uh, when he came into the uh, intensive care unit, so you can see that he had uh, mild anemia with a hemoglobin of 10.3 grams per deciliter. He had an erased ESR of 90 and low normal platelets of 157. Um, he had evidence of moderate renal failure with an estimated GFR was something close to 45 and creatinine of 2.1. Uh, electrolytes were within normal limits. He had a raised alkaline phosphatase and he had a raised GGT. The other investigations, including the phosphorus and the calcium, were within normal limits. So since he presented with uh, features suggestive of cardiac failure, so as part of our standard protocol, we did our baseline cardiac biomarkers. And you could see that the troponin T was elevated with 0 0.6 uh, nanograms per ml. And he had an NT pro BNP was in the range of 4,200 micrograms per ml. So I think there was clear biomarker corroboration of his clear presentation with um, heart failure. So obviously the next uh, subsequent investigations that we would choose to have in this patient would be an ECG and an echo since this patient has come with gross uh, heart failure. So the ECG was notable for sinus rhythm and he had low voltage complexes. If you see the limb leads, you can see that the QRS voltages are quite low. Um, so the QRS voltages are low. There are some non-specific T inversions in the limb leads and you can also see that the R wave progression is sub -op, is, uh, is uh, not that great from V1 to V3. And you can also see some uh, non specific T inversions from V4 to V6. And I think the low voltage complexes uh, in this ECG would be a big clue to what would subsequently uh, be a clinical clue in the evaluation of our patient. So the next investigation, of course, is the um, echocardiogram. And um, I can. So this is the parasternal long axis view. You can see that uh, the key findings are there's a dilated left atrium over here, and you can see this is the markedly thickened interventricular septum, which measured as much as 1.8 centimeters. And you can also see there's markedly thickened the basal inferolateral segment. And if you could see the um, 
this is the apical four chamber view. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. This is the right atrium, right ventricle. You can see there's a dilated left atrium and you can see there's marked thickening of the interventricular septum. And you can also see there is some increased thickening of the right ventricular free wall right over here. So you can also see from this image uh, that although the radial function, I've not, I've not put a short axis view, the longitudinal function seems to be reasonably impaired in this view. And you could see that the, the, the density of the myocardium seems to be a little sparkling density, one would call it. Uh, um, it, it, it something of a grainy speckling pattern as was traditionally described in infiltrative heart diseases. So it, it, the echo was also notable for severe diastolic dysfunction of grade two and the longitudinal tissue Doppler velocity. So essentially the tissue Doppler velocities were, gross, were significantly impaired uh, up to 0 0.04 meters per second in the mitral, uh, medial, as well as lateral longitudinal tissue Doppler velocities. So this is something called a, um, this is, uh, a 2D speckle tracking uh, strain map. This is called a bullseye map. Essentially, the left ventricular segments are spread out over a bullseye map. And uh, to make it very simple to understand, the lighter colors are those areas of the left ventricle where the strain values are low, where the myocardial deformation is impaired. So the deeper the colors, that is the, the deeper colored red areas are those areas where the strain is, uh, is uh, retained or strain is preserved. And the intermediate color density are those areas where strain is low, but not as low as the pale colored sections. So here the summary is that the, in the apical segments, the strain is preserved in this patient. And as you can see on the right-hand side, the global longitudinal strain is something like at minus 10.6%, which is significantly impaired. So this is a pattern which we might see in patients with cardiac amyloidosis, but it's not specific for cardiac amyloidosis, but the presence of this is a useful pointer in that uh, direction. So in our institute, when, when, whenever we are faced with infiltrated cardiomyopathy question, it's standard protocol to submit these patients to see cardiac CMR. And this is an SSFP sequence of CMR where you can see the structure, uh, high definition structural details of this patient. And as you can see, more or less what we saw on the echo, you can see that there is an increased thickness of the interventricular septum as well as the lateral wall. So it's a diffuse concentric hypertrophy. You can see dilated atria. You can also see thickened uh, intraatrial septum. And you can also see thickening of the right ventricular free wall. Importantly, apart from the cardiac details, you can see there are bilateral moderate pleural effusions. These white densities that you see in the lower half of the picture on the, on the right and the left side are pleural effusions, essentially uh, uh, collating with his presentation of heart failure. And the ejection fraction by volumetric assessment on the CMR was close to 35%. So this is the picture that we uh, presented with in terms of structure. So we proceeded with something called tissue characterization. So in our amyloid focus group, this is what we do our, at our institute. So we do some mapping, multi-parametric mapping modes called T1 and T2. So essentially T1 map is a modality on cardiac MRI where you measure the T1 uh, relaxation signals from the myocardium. It, it is high in myocardial infiltrative diseases and it was substantially high in our patient up to 1,650 milliseconds. The T2 uh, sequence is used to detect myocardial edema. In our patient, there was no significant evidence of myocardial edema as evidenced by a normal uh, T2 value of 46 to 48 uh, milliseconds. So the key finding was a markedly raised a T1 signal in our CMR. So at our institute, uh, we, we would, we'd like to adapt uh, what Gilmore and colleagues published in Circulation 2016, and this is a very useful clinical algorithm to have in terms of our understanding of where we need to move forward in our evaluation when we have a high clinical suspicion, as we do in our patient of cardiac amyloidosis with the echo findings and the CMR findings. So this is where we are. A uh, patient has presented with heart failure with echo and CMR features. So the next logical step would be to understand whether there are features on the serum electrophoresis uh, or light chain assay of features of light chain disease, whether there is a monoclonal protein present or not. And that's the next step in the algorithm. We did not, we did not do the bone scintigraphy because at that time when we had this patient with us, we did not have this facility, but off late we have been doing this and I'm happy to discuss this probably later in the Q&A. So investigating further for biochemical evidence, it was clear that this patient did have an M spike seen towards the center of the gamma region with an M protein of something like 0 0.7 grams per deciliter and clearly abnormal free light chain assay values with a lambda in the range of 242 
and copper of 37.41 and the copper lumber ratio of 0.28 and FLC difference was 205. Fairly normal gamma globulin levels of IgA, M and G. So the clear pointer here is that there was an M spike with 0. 0.7 grams per deciliter, and there was a lambda free light of 242, indicating that we may be dealing with increased circulating uh, free light chain uh, assay. So, so the next step uh, is to understand whether we can histologically confirm uh, in the light of circulating free light chain assays, uh, whether we can uh, demonstrate amyloid deposit in any of the screening biopsy sites. And that's what we proceeded to do. So we did a rectal, rectal biopsy and uh, biopsy of the rectal polyp, which showed amyloid deposit with the, uh, the characteristic uh, apple green bright refringence and polarized light. We also managed to demonstrate significant amyloid deposits on the bone marrow. And the bone marrow was also significant for the fact that it was hypercellular with increase in interstitial plasma cells and a 12% plasma cells on the bone marrow aspiration with a background of hypercellularity. So we also did, we proceeded to uh, move ahead with a PET CT because we now have evidence of uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, probable cardiac amyloidosis. We have now demonstrated increased free light change in the free light assay. And now we have demonstrated amyloid uh, deposition in one of the screening biopsy areas, and that's the bone marrow as well as the rectum. So in this case, we needed to rule out any lytic lesions. We needed to understand whether there were any bony lesions which light up during the PET CT, and it was negative apart from a small lit up zone in the left lobe of the thyroid, uh, there were no other positive findings on the uh, PET CT. So, so at the end of this, we are now left with a diagnosis, putting everything together. We, we sort of aimed at a diagnosis of um, AL light chain cardiac amyloidosis. So we needed to understand where our patient fitted uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of prognostication and the stage. So if you apply the revised staging, the Mayo system, so our patient is in stage four by virtue of the fact that he had an elevated NT pro and B, he had an elevated drop T, and the uh, free light chain difference was definitely more than 18. So, so we were clearly in the region of stage four, and we needed to uh, treat him as such. So as a summary of therapy, of course, uh, this is... Uh, we have an active cardio oncology unit in our hospital and after due uh, consultation and discussion with them. So the first stage of therapy was decongestion because the patient had presented with uh, obvious heart failure and that was managed with diuretics and low dose beta blockade because of his high baseline heart rate. One would be cautious while using beta blockade in the presence of cardiac amyloidosis because they can tend to have bradyarrhythmias, but a low dose can sometimes be judiciously used. Source therapy, our oncology colleagues started him on Cyborg D regimen and of course, subsequently he underwent clinical monitoring, monitoring for worsening of heart failure symptoms, renal function monitoring, electrolytes, and of course, baseline and follow-up CBCs. There was a very positive clinical response. It was fortunate, he was fortunate to have a very positive clinical response over the subsequent months. His NYHA class removed remarkably from NYHA class four to one to two. Significant decrease in venous congestion, significant decrease in the pedal edema and ascites, and he was able to return to his routine normal activities. So we did a follow-up imaging as is our protocol for, CM, for amyloid patients when they're on treatment for CMR. And as you can see, the thickness and the other structural features remain the same, but as you can see, the contractility of the left ventricle definitely has, has improved as opposed to the initial baseline CMR. And as you can see on the right-hand side panel, you can see that the strain maps on the echo have marginally improved to minus 12.3 from a baseline of minus 10. I would not quantify this as a great leap in improvement, but at least I think there's positive trend, or I would say that the strain maps are stable in this patient. And of course, we need longer follow-up data on this patient to comment uh, on the Sean, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, We're okay. running out of time. Sir. Yeah, I'm just finishing it up. Yeah. So, so as you can see here in the response metrics, our patient has favorably responded in terms of heart failure control, new NYHA class improvement, free light chain assays, and cardiac bio markers. So in summary, I think I would like to say that when managing cardiac amyloidosis, there should be a high index of suspicion, which would, should trigger the evaluation cascade. There should be timely source therapy and response assessment. And I would like to emphasize the definite role of multimodality cardiac imaging and cardiac biomarkers. And as you can see, there has been a sustained fall in the biomarkers during the course of this treatment of this patient from day one to day 730. And you can see there has been a sustained suppression of free light chain response. Thank you for your patient listening. And I would like to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you. And there was some hitch with my computer. So um, uh, thank you, Hisham, for taking us through 
uh, one of the classical uh, uh, pictures that we encounter for uh, amyloidosis and particularly involving the, uh, uh, the heart. Uh, and uh, you have shown some of the most classical uh, pictures that we don't always encounter with a patient. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, important for us to understand uh, what cardiac amyloidosis is all about and how to go about it. And uh, some of the key things that we need to understand is most patients are elderly, they present with cardiac dysfunction, uh, and you need to uh, look at the, uh, uh, one of the interventricular septal uh, things, as you mentioned, is one of the key features that we identify, uh, and also to monitor responses to the standard treatment, which you have also alluded to, which is a cyborg D that we take these days. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, uh, properly put forward is that we know about cardiac amyloidosis. When they present, they do present with us. But how many of us with multiple myeloma do we really look at, uh, looking at the cardiac uh, uh, status in such patients uh, for amyloidosis? Because it is not done routinely. But uh, any ideas would you like to uh, talk about as to when you would ask a patient to be evaluated for uh, a cardiac dysfunction? Because that is something that is not routinely looked into. Yeah, so, so I think that's a very pertinent question, I think, uh, because, because I think the high index of suspicion is extremely important when you're handling uh, these patients. So in terms of multiple myeloma per se, I think the percentages are rather low. Uh, to the to the tune of uh, less than fifteen percent when it comes to uh, data yes. which has been it's about data, which, yeah twelve to twenty nine percent usually it, it, around twelve exactly. to twenty nine percent yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 so so. Um, in, in terms of routinely looking for these patients, what we have been doing at our institute, and I think Dr. Wesley is here on the panel, so I think he will attest to the fact that um, we have now started um, looking very carefully at the baseline echo when these patients are diagnosed with multiple myeloma. Um, for um, not only do we apply the, uh, the baseline parameters, such as ejection fraction, tissue Doppler velocities, mitral inflow Doppler signals, uh, we also look at a strain map. And we also have a baseline biomarker assessment as well. So this strategy may not be validated in terms of large data published, but this is something which, have, which we have been uh, looking at uh, closely. So, so I do think that um, the high index of suspicion is extremely important um, in, these, uh, in these patients. But having said that, I think some of the multiple myeloma patients are also on drugs such as carfilzomib, uh, which can in fact uh, precipitate diastolic heart failure. So I think then there's a question of whether uh, the patient has diastolic heart failure secondary to possible amyloid, secondary to myeloma, or whether it's the drug uh, related uh, so it's, uh, it's, itself. I, I, would put, I would put it the other way. The patient yeah. who has... Uh, uh, incipient kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. amyloidosis yeah. or cardiac, they are more yeah. prone to develop cardiac dysfunction yes. when introduced to carfilzomib. So perhaps there is a role for us to uh, uh, to look at that more carefully in such patients before introducing carfilzomib, especially the elderly patients. I would agree. So, I would agree. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So um, uh, another uh, another question is how frequently? I mean, as a bedside tool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, would uh, how frequently do we rely so much upon the decline in the interventricular septal uh, thickness uh, for for actually uh, reduce i mean looking at responses in these patients because you rarely find uh, yeah. and how well trained you should be to look into it and how many times do the cardiologists really look at and i know in my clinical practice that uh, i really have to ask them to really look at it uh, otherwise it's not reported yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so i presume this question is in uh, monitoring the patients who are on therapy yes yes yeah. yes, uh, yes yeah. yeah so i think if you look at the data published uh, for uh, cardiac imaging in the context of uh, al cardiac amyloidosis um, one does not rely on the thickness of the interventricular septum uh, for these patients as a method for assessment. If you look at the last review, which uh, happened, which uh, that's a very elegant review in Jack Cardio Oncology uh, from the Stanford Amalot Group. And uh, there's another parallel paper in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging on how to image patients with cardiac amyloid. Um, it, they have never recommended, and, and it's interesting that uh, the recommendation is simply not there to look at the thickness of the interventricular septum. However, there are certain, in, in, in place of that, there are certain values which have prognostic benefits and they, are, they are happen to be 
the bullseye strain map, which I showed you, and the global longitudinal strain, which has certain prognostic effect. And if you look at the data from the National Amyloid Center at UCL in the UK and the Stanford Center, they are, con they are increasingly relying on a parameter called extracellular volume ECV on cardiac MRI, which tends to have a very high predictive and prognostic benefit in terms of assessing how much of amyloid load or burden uh, persists uh, after therapy has started. So I think to answer your question, uh, we do not rely on interventricular thickness as a method of response uh, anymore. We do rely on uh, uh, speckle tracking strain, and we have these novel parameters on CMR. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, so, uh, if, uh, can we so, go to the, so can uh, in we the interest? Yeah, so yeah can we, we can move, we move to the, the next the, Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Can you feel, if you will have the questions uh, uh, put up. Yes. So we have the cardiology overview and then the oncology overview as well. Uh, yes, yes. So I'll just introduce our uh, our uh, esteemed cardiologist, Dr. Krishnan Nair Venukopal, yes. cardiologist from Kerala, to please give the cardiology overview. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very impressed by your such a focused meeting, to attend such a focused meeting. Hisham has been my student also. It's a pleasure to listen to yes. Dr. Hisham presenting his slides so beautifully. As far as I am concerned, the amyloidosis earlier was a clinical curiosity, but as the, as the longevity of people have increased and malignancies have increased, now we are coming across this entity of amyloidosis much more commonly. Our classic teaching for the, from, to the cardiology community is that basically whenever you come across somebody with a left ventricular hypertrophy in the echocardiogram, which is unexplained by hypertension or aortic stenosis, then you have to start looking for, for the presence of amyloidosis. The other thing that we always look, we again, we teach is to look at the interatrial septum, which is again a marker of amyloidosis for the, for the cardiology fellows. Now, what has happened over this? This patient has some atypical features also because according to my impression, AL is more common in the younger age group patients. Here you have a 67 year old patient. So there are some atypical features also in, in this particular uh, patient group. I am more interested in the treatment part because Earlier, because in uh, amyloidosis, the treatment options are very, very little. Now, because of so much of advances in oncology and immunotherapy and chemotherapy, the lifespan of these patients have certainly improved. And earlier, we never used to consider cardiac transplant for these patients. Now, there are reports of cardiac transplant being offered. There are also reports of I series and all this being put in these patients with it. So, there has been a tremendous change in the management of uh, patients with cardiac amyloidosis. I think the most important thing is a very close association between the oncologist and the uh, cardiologist in the management of uh, these patients with cardiac amyloidosis. The problem is that the routine use of beta blockers or uh, calcium channel blockers are not uh, advocated. The other problem is also that digoxin, which was earlier considered to be a contraindication in the management of uh, amyloidosis, uh, the uh, amyloid, heart failure amyloidosis. Now there are reports that you can use digoxin because in one particular situation where there is atrial fibrillation and fast ventricular rate, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers may not be the ideal drug. So they can, you can use digoxin in a very guarded uh, way in this, in this patient population. One has to be extremely careful using ACE inhibitors and uh, the newer drugs like ARNI because of the vasodilatation might cost profound problems in these patients. The other management options, I think Hisham has covered most of the things which are uh, really uh, from a clinical curiosity in the early, earlier period. Now we are coming in more and more diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. And uh, I think with the treatment options that are available, the prognosis of these patients have tremendously improved. That's all the comments that I have to make. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We'll move on to the oncology overview. Uh, I now request Dr. Wesley Jose, medical oncologist from Kochi, to please give the oncology overview. Over to you, sir. Yeah, yeah. thank you, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so it was a wonderful presentation. It was good to be uh, here with my colleague, Dr. Hisham. Uh, we work on the same team, so uh, probably this was uh, a little bit more easier. Um, this is probably a prized patient, as Dr. Hari said, uh, the number of patients you might end up having uh, IL amyloidosis uh, who would walk out with a stage 
poor disease and then still be alive uh, two years, three years down the line, even though your documents say that you might you should be gone in six months. Uh, it's probably a fact that uh, when, as Dr. Venugopal said, you have the cardiologist and the oncologist putting their head together working in tandem, you probably have a much better outcome. Um, uh, this was uh, probably not something that uh, we would take uh, credit for. I think the patient landed up with uh, Hisham and uh, Hisham was uh, good enough to go around looking for reasons and then probably contacting us. Um, the other, other aspect of it uh, about the diagnostic and the rest of the things I think we've already discussed, uh, on, on the treatment front with the newer molecules that are available, I guess even the patients who are extremely uh, poor risk, uh, we don't need to write them off. There was a point in time where we did not have the drugs and probably melphalan and prednisolone was the only thing that we could play around with. And the data definitely says that those patients uh, did poorly. But with uh, the present argumentation that we have, uh, and also the fact that you have uh, a better modality to investigate, uh, the chances that you will pick these patients up probably earlier if you have a higher index of suspicion and you have a system where the cardio-oncology groups work well in the institution. Uh, there is also an option of stem cell transplant. Even if uh, you don't have many patients around who might probably benefit from it because of age and other comorbid factors, but there is a substantial number which you can probably pick and choose who would respond well to your uh, induction chemotherapy and then uh, we might be able to take for transplant. From our own uh, personal experience in the last uh, about five, six years of uh, transplant, uh, among the myeloma patients that we have transplanted, we had three of them who were pale amyloidosis. And uh, all three of them, thankfully, are uh, doing pretty well. Uh, this particular patient that uh, Dr. Hisham had put forward for this case presentation did not undergo a transplant primarily because he was already a 68, 7, 68-year-old gentleman. Uh, already had severe cardiac dysfunction, and he did extremely well on chemotherapy. So putting him through a very high treatment-related mortality uh, sort of uh, uh, procedure did not make much sense. So uh, to, to the extent of uh, uh, just systemic treatment, providing a good support and a good quality of life all the way down to, all the way up to stem cell transplant, are the options available? So what matters most at the moment probably is uh, close networking and uh, probably a uh, higher index of suspicion. Uh, like Dr. Hari said, uh, putting people who are through myelomas uh, and having an index of suspicion on them and getting your cardiologists involved might pick up even more patients uh, who, who might have amyloidosis. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I now request the chairperson to please moderate the question and answers. Over to you, sir. Uh, Hari sir, are you uh, are you able to unmute your mic? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have. Yeah, yeah. So from from uh, the first question is from Vivek Agarwala. Um, I'm sorry, there is some issue with my screen. And the question is: Is cardiac dysfunction reversible yes. in cardiac amyloidosis? So my computer is hung again. We can hear you. You can just ask. Uh, yeah, sir. Like, but actually, the problem is the, the uh, yes, sir. So uh, the problem is the the screen is blocked out. That's the problem. I can't see the screen. That's so I will I will repeat the question and you go ahead. Yes. Is cardiac dysfunction yes. reversible in cardiac amyloidosis. That is the question. I don't. I don't. So, yes. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. I think the cardiac dysfunction is, I don't think, reversible. It can be modified, it can be managed, but I don't think it is reversible. This is my opinion. Any comments from you? So, 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 uh, so if I may add to that, uh, that sometimes you may just be able to improve the cardiac function to a certain that's extent. That's a modification. So, yeah. So you might come from a high risk to an intermediate risk for, uh, sometimes, and that would just help. Yes. Uh, Dr. Hisham. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, I, I think um, uh, to add to that to add to that question, I think so. So, uh, from the initial days when uh, cardiac amyloidosis was considered just as a restrictive cardiomyopathy, and I think uh, in the last few decades our understanding has progressed considerably. Now we know that it's a restrictive 
toxic cardiomyopathy because now we know that the cardiac amyloid fibrils are in fact having a direct toxic effect on the myocyte so so if there's um, you know timely source therapy and if you can drive down your light chain levels really considerably like in our patient um, i think the recent data will stand as a testament to the fact that uh, some of the cardiac dysfunction is potentially uh, recoverable i probably not completely reversible i would say recoverable to some extent yeah this can prevent further deterioration yes yes absolutely you, you, we can step we can stabilize it because uh, yes. with the treatment that is going on we have been able to improve the survival of these patients uh, so to some extent there is some degree of improvement though not reversibility yeah, yeah. so uh, can we yeah, go I to the next I, question i, I agree and uh, the only thing that i would probably add is uh, there are there are data coming up where uh, looking at drugs Uh, which would uh, dissolve basically your uh, beta pleated uh, amyloid is the one which is causing the problem so uh, the uh, yes. possibility yeah. of these proteins being dissolved and uh, being made soluble might add to some more benefit if that would happen you would probably have less of infiltration or at least the infiltrative uh, muscles would probably improve and have a better outcome yeah. but this is still uh, yeah. in earlier phases yeah. of well, studies unfortunately those drugs in the phase 2 can prevent are... further progression i think but not reversible Yeah, they yeah it is probably not reversible probably not yes yeah. further progression can be uh, done but not reversed the development of such uh, drugs have been stopped in the phase 2 because the outcomes were bad bad yes yes so can we can we go to the next question uh, which is uh, all uh, is from dr shakir all um, all those tests probably cost a fortune do we have any program at our center for poor for the poor i'm just curious because my suspected amyloidosis cases refused admission due to financial reasons uh, and, and never came back uh, i think this is a this is a, a problem if i may take this question i think this is a problem uh, that we all face over here um, it, it, sometimes we do cardiac mris to actually assess to do that was also going to be a challenge and not many centers are equipped to do that uh, doing a 2d echo uh in the hands of an expert who actually has a suspicion to do that uh, i mean to suspicion to uh, to to diagnose uh, ca cardiac amyloidosis is something that can be done at a bedside which is not a very expensive test but i do accept that many patients by the time they come to you are in a severely compromised state um wherein your results in terms of uh, bringing about changes by your treatment uh, is going to be at best very modest uh so this is this is a problem that we all face uh, i i can open it out to some of our uh, speakers to 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 answer that if you do a gls that really goes a long way the typical yes. like, yes. cerebral on top sign i mean the the, the preserved uh, gls the, the the center of the bullseye the apex yes uh, yes that really you can give a good clue i mean mm -hmm. uh, that really goes a long way to make a real direction towards what you're looking for so that that's a point which i made earlier that any patient with a left ventricular hypertrophy that you come across routinely those yeah. patients should not be confined to a routine ef alone there you should start looking at the gls and start thinking of other possibilities other than just hypertension or uh, aortic valve obstruction lv outflow obstruction so this that is how you pick up this stray cases of amyloidosis or rare case of amyloidosis lvh uh, in echo but uh, low voltage complex in ecg yes really history of amyloidosis men yes. and then and then if you have a suspicion we may want to just send the pro bnp and drop t and, and then find out whether that corroborates that's what we generally do as baseline tests for such patients so uh, the next question uh, is is spectroscope spectrophotometry uh, available in india uh, the cost investigations uh, and any other investigation that can characterize the amyloid uh, i open it out to uh, our uh, we do have it we do have the cardiologist it. yeah yeah about the cost i'm not sure and the call no i can find out a little of the cost yes yeah thank you um uh if there are no more uh questions uh, uh, i would just like to conclude over here and i would thank uh, our speaker and also the active participation uh by by our card my cardiology colleague and and dr wesley thank you
Uh, thank you so much, sir. Now I'd request our honorary secretary of the Asian Cardio Oncology Society to please give the thank you note. Over to you, sir. Yeah, I think uh, we had a really wonderful session today. Uh, arrhythmias in uh, uh, oncology is something that uh, we would never find anybody discussing. I think today was the first lecture that I ever heard somebody focusing on arrhythmias in oncology. It was a wonderful listening to Dr. Uh, Fradley. Uh, I think we also had a very nice uh, discussion on pediatric cardio-oncology. Uh, the, uh, the, the moderators and the participants were wanting more time. And I think we had exceeded the time in this very excellent and interesting case presentation on cardiac amyloidosis also. I must say it is a very challenging field. Uh, I currently have a case uh, by where my cardiologist is asking me whether I should delist this case from uh, cardiac transplant or not. And uh, I have to conclusively find it out whether this patient is having cardiac amyloidosis only due to ATTR or is it uh, uh, MGUS or myeloma related and there aren't en you know, enough uh, plasma cells or light chain restriction. So, you know, which is a very challenging uh, uh, sometimes uh, to take a decision whether we should delist this patient from transplant or not is having very... So I think you know, a very fruitful discussion that we had today. I thank uh, all the faculties for contributing to today's discussion. I thank yeah. all the participants. And uh, I request me. everyone, if you have not Is taken uh, membership, on. please uh, take membership of uh, Asian Cardio Oncology Society. Uh, and we you know, uh, intend to continue these uh, uh, Asian Cardio Oncology Society meetings further on. And uh, I, I would invite you again next week, uh, Thursday, for another uh, last series of our uh, Asian Cardiology, uh, Asian Cardio Oncology series meeting, after which we would uh, be having a monthly meetings. Uh, a very good evening to all of you.